We're going to be looking at, uh, within the nature of proof, uh, this is actually kind of the last sort of section within this topic of proof. Uh, much shorter than complex numbers, though to be fair, um, we actually did two big chunks of complex numbers that the syllabus treats separately. We just kind of did them as one big whole. That's why it took all of last term, okay? And you're like, whoa, it's only week four. Um, what's going on there? So yes, we are coming toward the end because it's a shorter topic. I will point out though that even though this is the last kind of section, um, there are many things underneath this one heading as you'll discover over the next uh, week and which you partly already know from the Mathematics Extension 1 induction that you have done from last year. Now, back in a time when um, <laughs> when people wanted to watch a TV show, they did not just get to binge watch all 17 episodes in one hit. You actually had to wait like seven days. You'd watch an hour and then you'd be like, oh no, I have to wait a whole week to find out what happens. A week would pass and then, you know, they had to assume you probably forgot what happened in the last episode. So they would sometimes begin previously in... What's on, what's on TV these days? Um, I'm just trying to think. I don't know, previously on WandaVision or whatever happened to be that you were watching, right? Uh, well, I guess WandaVision is doing that because they are making you wait. Duh, Disney. Anyway, I'm going to do that for you now because it was some time ago that we had a look at induction. So help me remember, um, how does induction work? There's kind of three main steps that go into every uh, single proof by induction. And they helpfully make a very nice acronym that's like ironically convenient. Can anyone tell me what's the first thing you do, regardless of what result you got? What's the first step? Okay, we proved the base case. I'm going to say um, T for test, just because I'm going to use the letter P for something else in a second. Um, so we test the base case, and you know, if it's a proper proof by induction, we assume it works. Okay, that that checks out. Fantastic. What's the next thing we do? We assume, right? So we say this statement that you're presenting to me. I'm just going to assume it's true for some arbitrary number, right? And we tend to say uh, we tend to call that number K. Right? So we've got that assumption, we just literally write that down, and then the real work begins. What is the final most important step? Okay, so we're required to prove that the statement is true, not for n equals k, because we already assume that, but for n equals the next case, right? And this is where usually the bulk of our thinking actually goes. So um, I said it was a convenient acronym. I don't know if you got that metaphor for you. You know Mrs. Lee's and I love metaphors. Um, the way induction works is it starts from this initial case, and then once you prove this logic, you can then get all of the cases subsequently to just collapse, like you're tapping a chain of dominoes, right? So it's like, oh, wonderful, this works. Or maybe you heard the ladder analogy. So you just you don't tap ladders, though, OK? Now, this is what we did. And I want to um, ask you, see if you can remember, um, if we go back like earlier on, there were really two categories of things that we asked you to prove within Mathematics Extension 1. I know I'm sort of pulling on like old threads here, but I wonder if within the whole class we can remember what were the two overall categories of problems we could, um, or statements we could prove within extension 1. And remember? Uh, okay, sure, sure. Divisibility and All right, hold on. Divisibility. I paused because I was like, ooh, is your, finished? If, is your sentence finished? Um, divisibility, let's just remember what that is. You've got some expression, usually some algebraic expression, and they say for all of the values that you put into this, it'll always be divisible by 6 or 7 or 8, which is, which is kind of cool. Now then should be said, um, arithmetic, uh, within that, more specifically, there was something we spent a lot of time on. It was actually a new topic from last year. Do you remember? When you have like, think about this, we're like adding up a bunch of different things as you go further and further, Turin. Yeah, very good. So it was almost always series of some kind. And by the way, I suppose we could have geometric ones in there too. There's no reason why you couldn't have uh, both of those, right? Now you may have gone in each of your classes um, a little bit further past that because actually within the Extension 1 course of the past, uh, there used to be a lot more under induction. Um, and part of the reason why we're kind of like in our brains and in our textbooks, we're like, oh, if you can do these, you can handle other ones as well. But in our new world, uh, what we call further, very undescriptive words, like now we have more of it to do. In Extension 2, we reserve much more challenging kinds of mathematical induction to do. For instance, what was the last thing, the very last thing we looked at within extension to nature of proof? What kind of objects were we looking at? Uh, 
starts with an I. We're looking at inequalities, right? So we would say, oh, can you prove some expression like, uh, I don't know, something like this for some particular values, right? We can do several of these proofs by induction, but we don't do that with an extension one, we do it in extension two. Okay, so we're gonna add to this, we're gonna put, um, what did I just say? We're gonna put inequalities under here, we're gonna put geometry under here, we're gonna put calculus under here, that's what we're gonna spend over the next few lessons. Um, but today, I just wanna focus on one of the key differences, which is very early on, it's with this. You usually kind of skip over this, like it's sort of a brainless step, right? In extension one, there's a good reason for that. Uh, what is the base case usually in extension one? It's usually just one. Sometimes we'll throw a zero at you, but that's it in extension one. It's zero or it's one. And importantly, going on down to this last step here, if we start with one, then the next one's two, and then three, and then four. Within extension two, we say, well, what if the gap between each of those increments isn't just one? What if we wanted, say, the even integers? Then n equals k plus one would not be the next case. It'd be n equals k plus two, because that's the gap between the even numbers. There's no reason why we can't have other gaps as well. Multiples of three, multiples of whatever I want, okay? So that's gonna be the first distinction that we have a look at. So as an example, and uh, pick up your pens if you haven't already. This is the first one we're going to do. For instance, prove, memory of a goldfish. <clears throat> Two to the n is greater than n squared four. I don't need this thing at the top anymore. Now, having just reviewed a little bit of your brain for how induction works, maybe you feel like I could totally make a start on this and I'm gonna ask you to do that in a second. But before we do, as I pointed out before, the first difference in extension two is this very first step, not a major difference, but this first step is gonna be substantially different. You can't test n equals one for this. I mean, just have a quick look at it, right? Is this always going to work? One, two, three, four, etc. You can clearly see there are going to be some small values for which this is not going to work. Mm, n equals three, for example, right? Uh, eight, not bigger than nine, okay? So where are we going to begin given the particular restriction that I provided for you? Five, because I've said n is greater than four, not including four, right? And I'm dealing with, I mean, it's induction, so I'm dealing with whole numbers. So let's go ahead and just say test n equals five. Now, I've not just given you a, uh, different start uh, for, for n. I've also given you an inequality. Uh, so it's not just as simple as just put it in and see what happens. I'm just going to give you, it'll look weird, but I'm going to give you a recommendation for how to set out this next bit, being that we've got an inequality. I'm going to test this in the right-hand side first. Seems weird. Why am I starting with the right? You'll see why in about 45 seconds. Not complicated. Right-hand side, in this case, for n equals 5 equals? 25. It's 25, right? There's my five squared, happy times. Now I'm gonna to go to the left-hand side. The left-hand side is two to the power of five. Two to the power of five is 32. Come on guys, powers of two, they're not that hard, right? Now, why, have I, why did I start with the right-hand side? It's so that for this next line, ah, I've already got the right-hand side. I've now just established that the left-hand side is bigger than the right-hand side. Yeah, do you see that? Left-hand side stays on the left-hand side, and my inequality is facing in the same direction. Do you remember on Tuesday I said, unlike equations, you've got to be quite careful with which direction things are flying. Um, this just lets you write the left on the left and the right on the right. If you had started with the left and then finished with the right, you have to write it backwards. Okay, there's my base case, happy times. I think you guys know how to assume <laughs> that this is gonna be true for n equals k, so I'm not gonna write that. I'll write that in a second. But then, lastly, and I'm gonna get you to have a go at this, right? When you do your proof step, when you do your proof step, for now we're just thinking about like four, uh, sorry, five, six, seven, and so on. So worry about bigger gaps in my next example, our next example. But I'm just gonna warn you, right? Normally you would just assume, then you'd write down your k plus one, and then you just start turning the handle, right? And you look for some place that you can potentially substitute in 
your assumption, right? I'm just gonna give you two cautions. Caution number one, these are inequalities. Inequalities are a little bit dicier to just substitute into than equations, right? If the things are equal in equations, then you just pop it in, right? With inequalities, we've seen already, you have to be a little more cautious. It's doable. I think you guys can manage it without me like walking your hand, you know, holding your hand through it, walking your hand. Uh, but I'm just flagging it right now. Okay, there's the first one. The second one is because this is true, right? And um, Emmanuel and I were just talking about this yesterday, actually. We don't give you information in a question. It's a bit of a bad habit of math teachers, actually. We don't give you information in a question unless it is relevant. Right? Um, I already just pointed out, this doesn't work for n equals 3, right? Doesn't even work for n equals 2, because then you have a, they're equal. I, I want it to be greater than, right? So you're going to have to make use of this fact somehow, right? You're not just going to be calling on this um, assumption that you're about to make, 2 to the k is greater than k squared. You somehow are going to have to bring in this. Uh, once you are doing k's and stuff like that, you have to say k is greater than 4 as well, okay? That's a bit trickier and you may not be able to do that on your own. So, I'm going to give you a few minutes to have a place, see how far you can get. Those are the two questions I'm going to give you and then we'll come back together after we've um, seen how you went with it. Off you go. Zop. I will acknowledge right from the outset, as with most of the proofs we've dealt with, uh, not just in this topic but like in all of mathematics, many ways to go about this and in fact, and this is Lisa and I have had this conversation many times. I'm going to give you a proof in a second. I'm not convinced at all that it is the best proof or the most elegant proof. Even I, as I write it, I'm like, mm, I think I could do better than this. But I think what I'm about to present to you, while it might be, it's going to take a few lines, okay, I'm going to get there. But I hope the thing about it that's best is, even if it's not the most concise, I think it's probably the clearest one that I can come up with. So, here we go. When it starts with inequalities, if you think back to Tuesday's lesson, there are several overall strategies that you can use to approach inequalities of any kind. Uh, one of them was to just start with something that you know and then work with that, right? Now, in this context, the only thing that I kind of really know that's, that's relevant is my assumption. Right? I'm assuming that to be true. So I'm just going to write by assumption, and let's just state, 2 to the k is greater than k squared. Uh, this is a bit different to a lot of the proofs by induction that we've done in the past. Often, with like these guys here, right? More frequently, you would start with something like maybe the left or the right hand side, and then you start doing some stuff to it, and then you'd be like, aha, I found the assumption. And then you do a substitution, like three or four lines in. Okay, so that's a distinction here. With inequalities, not always, but this is often a helpful thing to do.